Hey everybody, this is Alex Mercent from alexmercent.com and I wanted to do is talk about the value of school choice. At the end of the day, one of the most important things that anyone has in order to improve society and their own prospects is their education. At the amount of time, the money, and effort they put into improving their knowledge, skills, etc. Now, how you educate yourself can come in a lot of different ways. And this is why I think uh, school choice is important because it breaks apart that assumption that basically schooling and education are synonymous terms. Schooling is one way to educate yourself. And it's a way uh, to educate, a lot of people have been educated, but it's not the only way to educate yourself. And not everybody learns the same. So the whole idea behind the school choice movement is to allow there to be diversity of choice, to be a, a diversity of method in the way we educate, whether we're talking about K through 12 or even uh, post K through 12, to allow there to be more flexibility. There's a lot of regulations and a, a lot of burdens that make it difficult to sort of break out of that schooling mold of education. And ideally, you'd want to move some of that. Doesn't mean that there shouldn't be schooling. There's definitely room for schooling. And definitely a lot of people benefit from schooling. But what happens is that when you make it, whether it's a monopoly provider, when you take out competition out of any particular good or service, you lack innovation, prices go up, uh, etc. And there's a lot of different ways to sort of, again, how that could be innovated against. That we see in sort of private solutions, you can see charitable and for-profit solutions. Now in education, a couple interesting things we've seen are things like Khan Academy, free education, which you can actually educate yourself K through 12 purely on Khan Academy. Now can anybody just go on a computer and learn all that stuff all by themselves? No, it's not necessarily for everyone, but nothing is for everyone. There are people where schooling might actually be counterproductive for, who may need a different type of environment. Okay, and then there's things like Thales Academy where there's our actual private schools that are actually cheaper than most public and private schools. So in Virginia, where the Thales Academy exists, and if you haven't seen the Reason.com video on the Thales Academy, I highly recommend that you do. A uh, public school might spend like around a little bit over $9,000 per student. At a Thales Academy, they spend $5,500 per student. Now there are things that they don't offer that a public school may offer. There are, but what they do is they focus on the things that they need to offer to educate. They focus on what is the reason why you want to put your kid in school is to educate them and they focus on that. So things, yes, they don't offer things like transportation from the school. They don't offer things uh, like special needs education. They don't offer uh, school lunch per se. But again, those are um, things that maybe that model to create something that's affordable to more families needs to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean there can be models that incorporate those other things that people want to pay more, or create a school specifically for people with special needs costs that can scale the services and things needed for special needs students to a level where it can make it affordable for special needs students. Because right now you may have, um, you're, you're, you spread out special needs students across several schools, so you don't have the benefit of scale but an entrepreneur might be able to put something like that together. But again, we've taken, we've kind of killed the market for education in that regard. And then when it comes to like post K through 12, there's really interesting things like Prax, um, Prax University, or okay. Uh, what Prax does is really interesting. So instead of you going to school for four years, getting into a lot of debt and uh, just, you know, uh, having, having maybe questionable job prospects afterwards, what it does is they pair you up with a company right away and you become sort of an apprentice at the company um, and you pay. You're paying to go basically go work. Um, but you're paying maybe, let's say, 13 grand instead of spending 100 grand. And at the end of that work cycle where you are learning coursework to help you be a, you know, uh, a to learn a skill, to be a quality employee and a possible employer, um, at the end of the program, you can end up working for the company that you're with um, basically, that's the intention. The idea is that you, you basically are, are paying to be trained 
and then a, in a specific skill and then basically there's a job on the other side because the company already knows that you have the skills they need and that you've already been enculturated and you're not necessarily uh, so you've already graduated with job experience with skills etc all those things that you don't necessarily have after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars um, at a, a you know a public or private university Okay, and it's not doesn't mean that the university model doesn't make sense, that the liberal uh, arts education uh, doesn't make sense uh, in the sense of teaching you a variety of skills and a variety of knowledge to make you sort of a, the idea of being a more well-rounded person. There's a place for that, but then we got to realize that because of student loans and things like that, the model hasn't evolved, the model hasn't adapted. Right now, you're paying the same tuition regardless of what degree you get. While your income prospects for a psychology degree are completely different than your income prospects for like a doctor or a doctor's degree or a medical doctor degree. So essentially what happens is that by paying the same amount regardless of what your degree is, essentially those who have the potential for a lower income or are more likely to have a lower income are subsidizing the education for those with higher incomes. That sounds regressive to me. Um, now if you didn't necessarily have student loans or the student loan subsidies propping up that market with that pricing model basically what happens if banks actually had to take risks for the loans they made the students banks would do what's called underwriting meaning assessing the risk so if i said hey i want to get a, a what i actually i actually have a popular culture studies degree um, if i want to say i want to get a popular culture studies degree can i get uh, a loan they'll be like well we're only willing to lend you this much because these are your income prospects so what's going to happen Schools that want to offer that program, they're going to sit there and say, okay, we need to price the program based on what's affordable for people based on their income, based on what their income prospects are after the program and the loans they can get. So it would totally change the system. So you'd pay less. I Maybe you have paid, let's say, $7,000 to get that popular culture studies degree. Now afterwards, if I felt like I had a difficult time finding work, I could afford to go back to college and go another skill and get another degree. But uh, because of the way it is now, you only get one chance and you're going to graduate with a lot of debt no matter which major you choose. And if you choose a wrong one, life's going to be rough because you're paying the same price no matter what. That's a, that's a nonsensical pricing model, but it only exists because there's no reason to change it because you can always borrow the money to pay the price because of student loan subsidies. And that just means kids are more in debt and they're, they, it causes a lot of frustration. Now there are alternatives, again, Prax for those college students. There's Khan Academy, Thales for, for kids trying to find a, a better option in the K through 12. And then there's of course homeschooling where you see the Ron Paul homeschooling curriculum out there and stuff like that. I mean, even I have made like a economics playlist that you can find on YouTube for free uh, for a high school level economics education. The idea is that there are alternatives out there but the idea is that the burden that's placed by the cost of the current education apparatus is still there. The students with debt, uh, the kids who are going to failed schools because there is no competition, no innovation, and stagnation in being able to staff those uh, with the right people or the burden of excess administrators. That's why we need school choice. This is why we need to free up education, bring market forces to education. So that way, those alternatives can develop and grow. And people can be stuck out of the cycle that they're stuck in right now. They can be moved out of that cycle. My name is Alex Merced from alexmerced.com. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, I'm pro school choice. I'm pro anything that enables more options and more freedom and more market forces to be introduced to education, one of the most important things in the world. I mean, the most important things, education and healthcare, are where market forces have been taken out. And because of those lack of market forces, we're seeing prices go up insanely over time. It's time to stop the madness and, uh, you know, make markets free again. My name is Alex Merced from alexmerced.com. Have a great day and enjoy.